Okay, uh, very good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today marks the seventh part of our design lecture series. Uh, this afternoon, we'll be having our industry partner, uh, specifically in the field of architectural acoustics uh, from Phoenix uh, at KSM. Our two guest speakers who I will be introducing later on shortly are technical experts uh, who can provide additional technical knowledge, okay, which will be very helpful to your design as you proceed to the final phase of your project. Okay, before we proceed, uh, again, as a reminder, kindly uh, make sure that you mute your microphone and, and I encourage you to prepare your question as early as uh, during the lecture, okay? And I'll be asking those questions later on to our uh, distinguished guest speakers. You may also type in uh, your questions in the chat box anytime, and uh, I or we will be reading it later on. Okay, so just a brief introduction to start our lecture for today. Uh, our first uh, guest speaker um, is Ho uh, Zen Meng, uh, brings with him a vast experience in acoustic consultation and systems design for noise control solution. Okay, he has worked on numerous projects, both commercial and industrial. His services extend to uh, many clients across Malaysia and Asia Pacific, uh, like the One Mon Kiara Integrated Project, KPJ Ampang Hospital, Google Malaysia, and Russell West Connex Interchange in Sydney, Australia. Zen Meng is a is proficient in various design software such as Audion um, and SolidWorks. At KSM, Zen Meng develops technologies and techniques for noise control in unique sedative limitations. Our second guest speaker um, is uh, Mr. Chi Yiming, as the lead of KSM Group's Phoenix Division. He oversees its unhinged operation and ensures robust business and solutions development. He implements the QA and QC system to assure products and services that are compliant to international standards, ISO 9001 and ISO 14001 and OSHAS 18001. With over 10 years, of acoustic and noise control design experience. Uh, Yiming has been apl applying the insights he gained to enhance Phoenix research and test laboratory rigor. Concurrently, he supervises the project management for multiple mega projects in Malaysia and Australia. Okay, with them also is Jessica Chung. Okay, uh, she's responsible for, uh, we've been, talking since I think a few months ago, uh, organizing uh, the event and the lecture for today. Okay, so I think uh, without further delay, okay. Um, and also to add up, uh, KSM at Phoenix have done uh, several projects at Taylor's University Lakeside Campus. Okay, so I think there's a lot of things that they have done. Uh, uh, it may take time to elaborate. <laughs> Okay, so, but uh, probably they can share later on uh, if, if, if we have time, uh, the projects that they have done in, at Taylor's University. So without further delay, I would like to welcome our two guest speakers, uh, Mr. Ho Zen Meng and Mr. Chi Yiming. Okay, the floor is yours. The screen is yours, uh, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. see my screen? Yes, yeah. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. How's everyone doing? Hope everyone is fine uh, during this pandemic. 
Right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Isid, for, for the introduction uh, just now. Uh, first of all, I, I'm Chin, uh, and joining me here today is my colleague, uh, Mr. Ho. So we'll be sharing our experiences on how we balance form and function in the field of lecture. I'd like to thank uh, Taylor's University uh, for, for this opportunity. Uh, hopefully, we get to learn something today. And then... Uh, Get to, to integrate this circle design in the field of architecture. So first of all, uh, as a company, what does KSM do, right? So we offer consultation services as well as the supply of noise and vibration control products. So in terms of our uh, consultation, uh, we offer two types. One is the building acoustic consultancy as well as vibration control consultancy. So for consultancy works, uh, we usually go to site to take measurements, and then uh, we analyze those data, and then we come up with the design to address those issues, right? Be it within acoustics or vibration control, right? We also offer simulation services as well, uh, where we generate 3D models of our solutions, for our products, and then uh, we run simulation across those 3D models. So this helps our clients to visualize how our products actually uh, integrate into their systems. Uh, how does it affect the noise level at their site? Right? And then uh, we also have our fabrication yard in Bukit Ramaputra, Sungai Bulo, where we design and fabricate noise and vibration control products, such as silencers for XL fans, centrifugal fans, enclosures for machineries, generator sets, um, acoustic doors, acoustic louvers for room treatment, so on and so forth. Right? We also have our own test lab uh, where we perform factory acceptance tests uh, before we deliver our products out, as well as a R&D center right? to continuously improve on our products performance. So that's a brief introduction to our company. Uh, if you'd like to know more information, uh, feel free to visit our website. Right. So why are we here today? So this is an outline of what we'll be sharing today. Uh, first of all, we're going to an introduction to noise and how this impacts our daily lives. And then uh, we move on to some of the factors or elements when we talk about acoustic design. And then we'll move on with some of the case studies of case studies or examples of existing buildings where one may be good in building design but may be lacking in terms of acoustics, as well as uh, examples of buildings that have good acoustic design and also good uh, sorry, building, good building design and good acoustic design. Right? And then uh, we'll move on to an example of our own. The, uh, Google Office in KL, which we recently completed, where we share our key goals and strategies of how we achieve this optimum balance between a good building and acoustic design. And then last but not least, uh, we open to the floor for Q&A. Right, so throughout the presentation, uh, please feel free to uh, write your questions in the chat box, and then uh, we'll address them uh, at the Q&A session. So, what is noise? Right? Can anybody tell me what noise is? Anyone? Okay. Well, yes. Did someone say something? Uh, unpleasant sound. Yeah, that's one. Any more? One else? Okay, that's good. Unnecessary sound. Waves. Anybody else? <clears throat> All right. Guys, don't be shy. <laughs> Okay, anyway, okay. <laughs> I'm not sound, right? That, uh, that we're exposed to in our daily lives. 
And so according to the World Health Organization, noise actually has serious health effects when one is exposed to long periods of time in a loud environment. And so you can have hearing impairment uh, when you're not well rested, uh, it lead to a, like hypertension, heart diseases, as well as mental illnesses. Right? In fact, uh, in Europe, WHO has, has actually conducted a study uh, where they found that at least 1 million healthy life years are lost every year due to traffic noise alone. So this doesn't even take into account noise from the industrial side, right? uh, noise from your machines, uh, noise at your workplace. So this is just traffic noise alone. So many of us are actually uh, so used to being in a loud noise environment that we are not aware that we're actually in a high noise area. So this is what we are going to share today. Uh, why acoustics is important in building design. Right. So I'm going to share a snippet of Julian Treasure's TED Talk, uh, where he talks about uh, what acoustics is, right? How, how acoustics affects a room or space, and how does it affect our daily lives? Right. It's time to start designing for our ears. Architects and designers tend to focus exclusively on these. They use these to design with and they design for them, which is why we end up sitting in restaurants that look like this and sound like this, shouting from a foot away to try and be heard by our dinner companion. Or why we get on airplanes, which cost 200 million pounds, with somebody talking through an old-fashioned telephone handset on a cheap stereo system, making us jump out of our skins. We're designing environments that make us crazy. And it's not just our quality of life which suffers. It's our health, our social behavior, and our productivity as well. How does this work? Well, two ways. First of all, ambience. I have a whole TED talk about this. Sound affects us physiologically, psychologically, cognitively, and behaviorally all the time. The sound around us is affecting us even though we're not conscious of it. There's a second way though as well. That's interference. Communication requires sending and receiving. And I have a, another whole TED talk about the importance of conscious listening. But I can send as well as I like, and you can be brilliant conscious listeners, if the space I'm sending in is not effective, that communication can't happen. Spaces tend to include noise and acoustics. A room like this has acoustics. This one, very good acoustics. Right. How many of you have actually been in that situation? Sure, many of you, in fact, most of you have been in that situation. For example, when you're in a restaurant, right, having a meal with your friends or family, then when you're trying to have a conversation, and when the ambient noise is so loud that you actually have to shout to get your message across, right? So I'm sure you guys have experienced that. And sometimes it can be a really unpleasant experience. Right? So this is what, uh, this is why acoustics is important. So when you have a good acoustic design space or room, uh, you can have meaningful conversations, you can have effective communications, as well as a comfortable place for you to be in. Okay? So hopefully we can achieve this today. Right. So when you talk about acoustics, usually one tends to associate acoustics with buildings that have some sort of musical uh, elements in it, such as the Philharmonic Orchestra, uh, sound studios, maybe uh, even a R&D lab for speaker manufacturers. Right? But that's not limited to, to, to that, those spaces alone. Right? Acoustics can also be done in classrooms, uh, it can be done in offices, even like the restaurant you saw just now, right? or even at your own house. So all these spaces can have uh, acoustics design in it. So these are some of the uh, factors or elements when we talk about acoustic design. Right? For example, you have your vibration time. Right? This is a measure of how 
how much echo is generated in the, the room or space. Then you have speech privacy, speech intelligibility, what are the noise sources around that space and how does it affect the room, the, the sound in the room, right? How does the room layout affect the acoustics? How does the building material affect the acoustics? So we'll revisit this slide again later on uh, when we share our key strategies on how we achieve uh, balanced design. And key strategies and key goals on how we, we integrate this acoustic design in architectural design. So moving forward over the next few slides, uh, I'll share some examples of existing buildings that may have good building design, but may be lacking in terms of acoustics, as well as a few examples of buildings that have a balance of both, right? Good building design and good acoustics. So first of all, uh, we have this example of faculty of law building in Cambridge, where it features a full height atrium as well as a curved glass wall. This is the, the glass wall here. So uh, they have a coffee area at the ground floor here, as well as a reading area on the upper floor. So when you have a full height atrium like this, noise is able to transmit via two ways. One is you have the direct noise from the ground floor to the upper floor. The second pathway is through the reflection of the curved glass wall, like this. So when you have two noises, two noise sources uh, combined, then what you have achieved is a high resultant noise level at the upper floor. So it will disturb whoever is at that space on the upper floor. So how do we solve this? So what they did was they introduced a transparent panel to isolate those two floors acoustically. So when you have a transparent panel like this over here, uh, noise wouldn't be able to transmit freely from the ground floor to the upper floor. And by having this transparent panel design as well, um, they are able to maintain the original design language of the building, which was to create the feeling of spaciousness in this space. So it was managed, uh, it's managed to, source, to serve two purposes, right? This transparent panel. One is to maintain the, the design language, and the other was to treat the acoustic in this space. Next example we have is the plenary complex of the German Bundestag. This is the uh, ex-parliament building of Germany, where it features a fully glassed building. So this was to showcase the transparency in the uh, democratic system at that time. So if you notice the picture over here, uh, the MPs are actually gathered around in a circular array. And then you have the media press or visitors on the upper floor here. Having a fully glass surface like this, uh, you have a room that is reverberant in nature. So what this means is a lot of echo is generated when one is speaking in this room. And then having a large room like this, you need some sort of um, sound system. So if you notice here, there's a loudspeaker installed on the ceiling at the center of the room. Right. This is to aid the uh, media or press over here. So here, what is being spoken about. Right. So when having a design like this, um, having a full, full glass building, there's a lack of adaptive surfaces. So that's why the, the echo is generated. Right. So how do we solve this? Sorry, oh, one more thing I forgot. Um, it, for a design like this, right, uh, coupled with the speaker installed on top, as well as the uh, glass surfaces, uh, 
what you have created is a acoustic concentration in the center of the room, where your acoustic profile is focused at the center of the room, causing the media press to not be able to hear what is what was being spoken about, as well as the MPs are sitting around. They will not be able to hear clearly what are their counterparts talking about. So how do we solve this? <clears throat> so in order to solve the echo issue, they had to add more adoptive surfaces to that space. So the only place that they could add any sort of absorption is the floor, the wooden flooring, where they added a heavy duty carpet. So here's the blue color carpet. The um, cushion sitting around. So the combination of the carpet and the seating increases the absorptive surface that the noise you know, is being absorbed. Right? So this reduces the echo generator in the room. But this treatment alone doesn't solve the acoustic focusing issue where your sound waves are still um, concentrated in the center of the room. So how did they go about this? They added perforations to the glass wall. Right? So they, they use a laser technique actually to introduce these micro perforations on the wall. So what these perforations do is they create a, a diffusing field. So when noise transmit past these holes, these micro perforations, they get uh, dispersed to a larger area of the room. And that reduces the focusing issue that they had before. Next, we have the Queensland Children's Hospital in Brisbane. So before we go into this uh, example, many of you may think, why is acoustics important in the healthcare industry? Anybody here knows why? Basically, it serves uh, two functions, right? So one is for patients' healing. So many studies have shown that when a patient is in a quiet, relaxed space, they tend to recover faster. Okay? Then the other one, the other reason is to have a private space for doctors and patients to, to have their conversations. Right? So imagining uh, you have, you have, you're having a conversation with your doctor, I'm sure you do not want your conversation to be heard by others, right? So having a good acoustic design in that hospital serves that purposes. Right? To give you a private space, to give you a safe space for you to talk about uh, whatever issues you have with your doctor. So coming back to this example, uh, this, this hospital is located beside a busy road. Also have their own helipad on top of their building. Right. So there's noise source here. One is from the traffic, and one is from the helicopter above. So how do we reduce this noise? How do we prevent the noise from external sources entering into the hospital? Do you notice the photo on your right? You see these uh, green colored panels here. These are what we call the uh, acoustic screens. Right? So it's a combination of these acoustic screens together with the concrete walls, the uh, double glazed windows. So when you have this combination of materials, they, they effectively become a noise barrier to the external noise. Even this tree here as well. This tree here is also able to absorb some of the external noise. Right? So that's how we treat the external noise from entering into the hospital. But what about within the hospital? Just now we mentioned about creating a private space, right? So it's also the same thing. Uh, to have a combination of building materials, such as wall panels, acoustic ceilings, uh, multi-glazed windows here. So all these materials come hand in hand to create a private space for, for patients and doctors, patients and doctors to, to, to have their conversation. Right? 
Then uh, since this is also a children's hospital, uh, we cannot have the hospital to be too quiet. So what they did is like public spaces, for example, the lobby, the play area. So you want, you want to create a more lively environment over there. So how do they do it? They use timber blocks. So if you notice the figurines here, um, they are all made up of timber blocks or wooden blocks. So they created in the form of trees, birds, that serves two purposes. One is to increase the aesthetics of the hospital. And the other is um, when you use wooden blocks like this, it creates a reflective plane for the noise to be reflected off these surfaces. So when you have that, uh, you create a likely environment in those public spaces. <clears throat> the last example we have here is the Loreto College in Brisbane, where this building is well known for its flexible learning spaces, um, where education doesn't just occur within the confines of four walls. Education also happens outside the classroom as well. Right over at this building, they also have a, a what you call a ground floor, a multi-purpose ground floor, which can be converted into a performing arts theatre. Right, so <clears throat> if you notice uh, the picture here, the school is also located beside a busy road where traffic lights is able to transmit into the college. A few exposed areas here where noise can transmit. So what they did was they installed acoustic screens, like these brown color screens, along the curvaceous design of the building. Right. Then on top of that, uh, they also used the noise dampening characteristics of concrete. They did not build a typical concrete wall, but they actually built a feature wall along the schoolyard as well as a curvaceous concrete sitting outside the classrooms along the hallway. So this creates a breakout space for them to, to have their informal discussions, uh, their meetings, or even a place for them to socialize. So how about within the classrooms? So within the classrooms, they also use a combination of materials uh, like wall panels, uh, acoustic ceilings, as well as a combination of you know, uh, vibrant colors right, to create that exciting learning environment within the school. So we have gone through examples of existing buildings. Right? Over the next few slides, we will go through an example of our own, uh, the Google Office in KL, where we showcase our key strategies on how we achieve this balance between a good building design and good acoustic design. Before that, uh, just to recap on some of the examples that I've shown earlier. Okay. So as you can see, uh, acoustic design is quite an important factor when you design a building. Right? Um, sometimes acoustic design can be neglected or often misloaned. Why, why is this, right? Because acoustics is something that one cannot see, but it's something that one will be able to feel or experience when they're in that room, when, when they're in that particular space. So hopefully after today, um, you guys, uh, the future architects, right? You'll be able to consider the acoustic aspects during the initial design phase. Because like, for example, some buildings are able to do some minor modifications to your design to achieve that desired acoustic profile. But sometimes that may, that may not be the case, right? Sometimes you may need to do major revamp works just to get that um, desired acoustic profile. So that will be very hard to do when the building is actually up and running. Right? So, uh, before we move on to our key strategies, is there like any questions so far? Yeah. 
Is there any questions from the floor? Guys, any question? <laughs> yeah, I think none. Yeah. Uh, Very clear. Yeah. Probably, they, yeah, they're reserving their questions later. <laughs> all right, all right. Okay. Sure. Thanks. Yeah. So if there's none, uh, I'll pass on to my colleague. Open to you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chin. Uh, okay. So I believe everyone has a pretty good understanding of uh, what constitutes an improper balance between form and function in acoustic terms. So I'm Ho. And so how do you plan to achieve the, uh, a balance between these two aspects? So uh, I'm going to share with you a few of our key strategies that we always use in terms of architectural acoustic uh, design. Okay, so before I start talking about that, let's go through the basic overview of what contributes to how a particular room or area sounds like. Uh, so we have always integrated these four elements in our acoustic design uh, consultation. So when we are asked to advise on the sound structure of the room, we always go through these four elements. First being the HVAC or the heat, ventilation, and air conditioning system. So this HVAC system is important in regulating uh, air, heat, and ventilation across the building. And most of the time, improper planning of this HVAC system can uh, actually cause excessive unwanted noise and vibration to the occupants themselves. So uh, as Mr. Chin here has earlier explained, that uh, we usually provide our uh, acoustic advice as well as manufacturing our, uh, our own product to help to solve this uh, problems. But I'm not going to go through that today. What I want to focus more on for this acoustic architectural are uh, more on the other three parameters. Reverberation time, speech intelligibility, and speech privacy. So, um, which brings us to our first key strategy of the day, understanding the key goals at the early stage. So, we often have to ask ourselves, what are the functions of the space or the room that we are designing for? What are we designing? Is it for tranquility purposes, like bedroom, formal discussion, meeting room, or perhaps a sports uh, function, like a basketball court? So what are we actually designing for? What are the functions? So once we understand the main function of the particular area, we can then pinpoint which element are we focusing on in our design. So when we are designing for our acoustic system, what questions came into your mind? What, what will you think of? Like what questions will you ask yourself? Perhaps this? Do you want the sound to disappear almost immediately after release? Or do you want it to linger around in the space for a right amount of time? So this condition is what we call reverberation time. Or maybe you want to ask, do you want to be able to hear others in the same room? Or do you not want that to happen? That is what we call speech intelligibility. Or do you want the others to be able to hear you or do you not want that to happen? You want to keep your conversation private. That is speech privacy. So speech privacy is actually an inverse of speech intelligibility where you do not want someone to actually understand what you are trying to say. So maybe I just go through a, a basic uh, explanation of this. So reverberation time, is actually a measure of how fast the sound fades away in a particular area. Speech intelligibility is a, a direct measure of the clarity of words and sentences understood by a particular listener. And speech privacy, as you may have guessed, is actually the uh, degree where you do not want to understand a particular listeners. You do not want to understand. You just happen to listen to the conversation unintentionally. So actually, speech privacy is an important parameter. Uh, a survey done by the University of Sydney actually uh, result in over half of cubicle and open office employees are dissatisfied by their workplace speech privacy. So this problem not only occurs in uh, open office, it actually occur in a lot of other places too, such as hospital, bank, library, and so on. So now 
I would like to share with you a snippet of the same guy that Mr. Chin referenced earlier, Mr. Julian Treasure. So to show you the how does it feel like to be in a room with different reverberation time, like perhaps a 1.4 second reverberation time and a 0 0.4 second reverberation time. So what, how does it feel like? What are different, the differences? So. A study in Florida just a few years ago found that if you're sitting where this photograph was taken in the classroom, row four, speech intelligibility is just 50%. Children are losing one word in two. Now that doesn't mean they only get half their education, but it does mean they have to work very hard to join the dots and understand what's going on. This is affected massively by reverberation time, how reverberant a room is. In a classroom with a reverberation time of 1.2 seconds, which is pretty common, this is what it sounds like. In language, infinitely many words can be written with a single set of letters. The arithmetic of infinitely many numbers can be composed just a few digits without a single zero. Not so good, is it? If you take that 1.2 seconds down to 0.4 seconds by installing acoustic treatments, sound absorbing materials, and so forth, this is what you get. In language, infinitely many words can be written with a small set of letters. In arithmetic, infinitely many numbers can be composed from just a few digits with the help of the symbol zero. What a difference. Now that education you would receive, and thanks to the British acoustician Adrian James for those simulations, the signal was the same, the background noise was the same, all that changed was the acoustics of the classroom in those two examples. So yeah, you see how the reverberation time can actually affect the condition in the room, particular room. And as you may have noticed, all the three parameters that I mentioned earlier on are actually kind of related to one another. So for a place with a highly reflective uh, surfaces, so there's, there will be a build up of noise level in the particular area for a short amount of time. So there will be a long reverberation time in the particular room, which causes low speech clarity, as you have uh, seen in the video previously. Like you wouldn't be able to understand clearly what uh, the speaker is trying to tell you. So we call that space a live space. On the other hand, if the, space, if the area has a lot of absorptive uh, uh, material, there will be a short reverberation time and the speech clarity is good, is high. We call that a dead space. So speech privacy can, uh, is actually kind of opposite to speech clarity in terms of if you are able to understand the person's, uh, what the speaker is trying to tell you, the speech privacy is actually not too good in the particular area. But if you are trying to uh, mention the speech privacy outside of the particular area, that's a different topic. So there'll be a different, it could be low or high depending on the wall structures of the particular area and the surrounding environment. So we were very fortunate to be able to uh, participate in the Google Office project in Manara Shell and Manara Asiata for the past year um, as, a, as their acoustic consultant. So we work very closely with the mechanical engineer consultant as well as the interior designers. So what we do is we provide our advice and help to design on different areas of the particular Google Office uh, floor, uh, for example, the huddle space, uh, which is a small discussion area uh, located in their open area office. So this might cause a bit of problem in terms of speech privacy as this just for a short discussion, but you do not want it to uh, cause disturbance to other people in the working office. So what we could do is maybe actually install an acoustic barrier in between, as you can see these stripes here. So these are kind of uh, acoustic barrier. It, can help to reduce the, the reverberation time in the area and to increase the speech privacy by a little bit in the area. So meeting room. So what are we looking at meeting room? We want the speech clarity to be clearer there. We want the room reverberation to be low. Games room. So what are we looking at for the games room? We want the, we want the sound to be staying inside the games room. We do not want the sound to escape the room. So the wall construction should be sufficient enough to reduce the transmission. Okay, uh, there are other rooms as well as a sleeping room. Uh, yes, there's a sleeping room for Google. So what we want is to uh, provide a sense of tranquility in the uh, space itself so that they can relax 
themselves and take a short nap or anything. There's also a phone booth there just for conference call and so on. So, so the floating floors are actually incorporated uh, a lot in Google offices in uh, Malaysia here, Menara Asiata and Menara Shell. So what are the purpose of these floating floors? Floating floors here um, uh, uh, is talking about they, they are separating the main structural uh, component of the floor and the surface that we are walking on. So what do you think are the purpose and advantages of these floating floors? Why do they incorporate this in their design? So these are, these are a few choices that you could choose off, that you could think of. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's all available. So basically floating floors actually used to isolate against structural noise and vibration and impact from any mechanical equipment that we could think of. Maybe there are blowers or there are issue systems or anything. So there's some vibration causes by the equipment that transmit through the floor to the open area of the working area. So it's, it causes some annoyance to the occupant and this floating floor can help to isolate these problems on. So, um, and it's also actually comfortable to walk on depending on what materials we use because usually there will be a, a cushion underlayment uh, on the floating floors and provide a pathway for little people in the space. I uh, know this is actually incorrect if you are wondering. Yeah. So moving on to the second key strategy is play around with materials. So uh, as you know, all materials have different acoustic properties. So what are the properties that we could think of? The ability to reflect sound, the ability to absorb, and the ability to transmit sound these three criteria of the materials. So, so when we want to design a situation where we want to reduce the reverberation time, what we could do, we always think of, okay, we can add more materials, soft materials with high absorption coefficient. When we want to increase the speech privacy, we use materials with low sound transmission class to reduce the sound trans transmit out of the room, right? But sometimes certain circumstances do not allow us to do that. So maybe we could not use a soft material in that particular room. So what we could do, so we, could, we must always remember there are always more than one suitable material for, to achieve the same particular goal. So um, we actually face the same problem in our Google project, which I will share later on. But before I move on to that, uh, let's uh, go through a basic overview of our timeline in the project. Okay, so working in the project, First of all, we have to do our due diligence. We have to evaluate the existing environment at the site area. So at the, at the first, at the initial moment, it's just an empty floor. There's nothing. There's no drapes, furnitures, or any partitions. It's just empty. So we have to evaluate the surrounding environment. What are the, any, any function, any facilities or any factors that could affect our design? We have to take note of that. Then we come up with our concept design where we develop our own strategies based on our first key strategy that I just mentioned. We have to understand what are the functions of each particular room and what elements are we looking at? What are we studying? Which elements is important for that space? Then the interior design uh, will produce their drawings based on our acoustic targets, our acoustic advice. They produce the whole schematic drawing and we will have a discussion uh, here and through to talk about these designs. So then we will evaluate if the performance is feasible. If it's not, then we back to the drawing. So it's so on and so on. And finally, once everything is reviewed and finalized, construction begins. So during this design development uh, uh, stage, we actually face a hurdle in a particular room in Google office called this tech talk room. So what's this tech talk room? Uh, tech talk room is actually a medium-sized room that they usually use to help any events or talks that are organized by Google employee themselves or some other visitors. So uh, during the in initial stage, we actually propose a few uh, materials for them before they finalize the whole concept. We actually advise them to use some acoustic ceiling to actually reduce the sound transmission out of the tech talk room because you know we do not want the event to cause an annoyance to the surrounding people. And also soft materials such as wall panels and carpet to just reduce the reverberation in the room and to increase the speaker's clarity, speech clarity. 
Uh, so, so the interior design designer take note of this and come up with the, their own design, their own drawing, incorporating this concept. So there are a few discussions uh, moving on here, but most of them revolves around the same concept, around this same concept. So, but until one day, they decide to just grab this off and change the whole concept and the whole team of this tech talk room. So they decide to change it to a more futuristic team. So all these materials can't be used anymore. As you can see here, they provide this sample to us. They wanted to have this such team in their tech talk room. There's no soft wall materials. We can't install any carpets or any acoustic ceiling. So what we can do? So we have a few rounds of discussion with them. And finally, we compromise with one another to achieve a balance between both the visual side the, to meet their team, as well as the acoustic side of the particular room. And this is the final concept design that we agreed on. So as you can see, so we scrap off the acoustic ceiling, but we could replace it with a micro perforated ceiling shown here. So as explained by Mr. Chin earlier also, so micro perforated design can help to actually disperse the noise and to reduce the noise inside the particular area. So it actually works the same goal as what we want with the soft panels. So as well as the columns, they use uh, some membrane some soft membrane to actually reduce the noise. We cannot install any soft panels. So the furnitures we use, we could propose using a soft cushion to just help to reduce the noise. And some acoustic drapes, acoustic curtains at the window pane area. Uh, as you can see, the carpet is back, but they choose a more futuristic design just to suit the team. So it still works out well. So how does it translate to the actual development, the actual site? So, just a picture here. So it actually quite closely resembles what we wanted here. So, it, and the acoustic system actually works pretty well in the end. So, yeah. So which brings us to the final key strategy of the day, fully utilize the existing space to overcome any limitation that we could think of. So as you see, there's not one material that we could use for a certain goal there's always a different way in achieving what we want. So we could, uh, if certain circumstances do not allow us to, achieve, to use our initial design, we look around the area, what could be done at certain areas? What could we adapt? What could we amend to, to achieve the same goal? So for example, we could always analyze the room shaping. So uh, if there's no space for a particular uh, four parallel wall rooms, we could always reduce the volume by having a slanted slope at one of the walls. And it's actually better for acoustic terms because it helps to disperse the sound in the particular area. So it's very useful if for the functions of meeting room maybe. So that's one. You could always be strategic about the adjacencies too. So let's say you are going to build a meeting rooms in a particular open area, uh, open working area, an office area. So uh, you do not want the noise from the meeting room to be an annoyance to the working area, to the occupants at the, at the area. But we could not do much in the meeting room itself, maybe just, just an example, we could not do much in the meeting room. So what could be done? So we could always look around, we could maybe separate the meeting room from the open area by having a small corridor or maybe an informal collaboration space so that the noise transmission may not be a big problem as to, when it's just right inside the working area. So the last example that I want to share with you regarding this Google Office is this small pre-function area, just right beside this tech talk room that I shared earlier on. So what was this pre-function area? So this area it serves to as uh, the guests and the employees to hang out after the event. Uh, initially, they have the same concept as the corridor, which is having a plaster ceiling and one flooring, which works okay, until we realize that there's a giant window pane just right, at, uh, just right beside the pre-function area at this side, which is facing the busy traffic. So plus this pre-function area is quite a compact area, and it definitely will cause a very high reverberation in the particular area and causes annoyance to everyone there. So what could be done at the pre-function area? It's just such a small area that we could not do much. So we try to look around. Can we perhaps separate the pre-function from the corridor area? 
so that the pre function will be its own area. So finally, we came upon this team, the greenhouse team for the pre function area. So as you can see, the red arrow points towards a glass door separating the corridor and the pre function area. So now the pre function area is its area by its own. It can have its own team. So why greenhouse team? So besides, uh, as you can see, there's a lot of plants in the area. And besides looking nice, giving a visual pleasing uh, uh, feeling to the occupants, actually plants could also help to reduce the sound in the particular area. So it's actually a win-win situation for everyone. So after uh, talking about these three key strategies, I would like to actually share one more technology that I find it interesting that's that being developed by Microsoft. It's still developing, but it's a kind of concept for the future of meetings. So as you know, we are currently in a pandemic right now. So most of us are either studying from home or working from home, and most of the meetings will be done virtually. So there's, there, there won't be any physical meeting for quite some time now. So they wanted to incorporate both physical and virtual meeting into one. They wanted to combine each, uh, both of them into one. So how do they do that? I'll show you. Today's Microsoft Teams rooms bridge the gap between in-person and remote meeting attendees, providing everyone high-quality, inclusive experiences. Going forward, these rooms will deliver more natural and immersive experiences for hybrid work. The focus room will evolve to connect in-person and remote attendees in a more unified experience with a larger screen where interactions feel more natural as you sit face-to-face -face across from life-size remote colleagues. A camera placed at eye level to improve eye contact, spatial audio so you hear people's voices from their position on the screen, and to enrich real-time collaboration, meeting chat notes, and actions will be at the forefront of all Teams rooms. Larger rooms with more attendees make it challenging for people working remotely to know who is present and who's talking. Teams rooms will deliver a meeting experience where everyone is fully represented and connections feel natural. We have reimagined the meeting room to bring people face to face with remote colleagues and unlock more space for people, content, and collaboration. Technology will fade to the background with premium microphones hidden in the ceiling. Intelligent camera technology will bring in room participants clearly into view through individual video streams. And spatial audio will help remote participants establish presence with a virtual seat in the room all so that you have more authentic connections with everyone in the meeting. Our vision for meetings is about leveling the playing field for everyone, where remote and in-person attendees are represented equally and everyone can collaborate without compromise. Such an interesting concept of having a combination of both virtual and physical meeting. But without improper planning, it could the acoustic problem could actually be an issue for everyone there. So we could always look at that. What, uh, how do we improve on the acoustic system for a particular technology like this, for the particular area for that? So by employing the three key strategies, let's take a look how. So first, we need to understand the function of this. What's the function of this technology? What's the function of this area that we are designing for? Hybrid meeting. Is a combination of both physical and virtual meeting. So what are the key elements that we are looking for for this technology? We want to reduce the background noise and increase speech intelligibility because by having a special audio, so meaning they will, the audio will be dispersed 360 degree throughout the room. So it will, if we didn't have a proper planning for the acoustic system, the noise may actually be a problem to the people outside of the meeting room. So we need to study how to reduce the background noise and to improve on the speech privacy of the particular area. And how do we do that? By having maybe a soft materials in the particular room like carpet, acoustic ceiling tunnels, and maybe foam panels. And if certain circumstances do not allow us to do that, we can always uh, swap it with a double glazed wall as it's nice and it serves the same purpose too. So, so going back to our main topic of the day, balancing form and function. So there's always this question, does uh, form comes before function or function comes before form? So what do you think? So 
for me, I believe function comes before form. Because as I mentioned in my first key strategy, you have to understand the function first before you could go on to design the particular area. You understand what you are designing for. One may argue uh, form comes before function for in different aspects, but that's another topic for another day. So what I want to stress today is having a proper balance between form and function in a particular area, especially the acoustic term of it. So whether we are designing for a hospital ward, a high school classroom, or a recording studio. So acoustic system is actually very important in producing a happy and satisfied and productive environment to all the occupants in the spaces. Uh, but in many uh, cases, acoustic is always overlooked. The main uh, focus in designing is always the sense of seeing. And the acoustic is always a side issue which are not part of the architectural design at all. So why, 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 why is it like this? Because it's not important, it's expensive, is yeah. So I would like to share with you a quote by acclaimed French architect Juhani Palasma. So once he wrote in his book, I quote him: "Sight isolates, whereas sound incorporates. Vision is directional, whereas sound is omnidirectional. The sense of sight implies exteriority, but sound creates an experience of interiority." So he gives further example uh, using film as a film, movie. So when you take the soundtrack out of a movie, the particular scene loses its plasticity, loses its life and what it wants to convey. The, you just feel less immersed in the particular film. So as you can see, uh, having uh, the balance between form and function is actually quite important. And this explains how sound and sight actually complements each other in more ways than we could always imagine. Yeah. Thank you. So I hope you enjoy the talk today and I would like to open the floor to any questions to, to other viewers. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Hon, Mr. Chin for a wonderful and very informative, uh, very helpful lecture for today. Yeah, 